And if it gets distracting, you can close it too. So let's get started. So welcome everybody. We're officially getting our class all about Congress and how Congress works. So we are so excited because so, we're here today with Tom Donnelly, one of our top scholars at the National Constitution Center. Tom, would you like to say hello to all of our students? Sure. Hi, I'm Tom Donnelly. I am the Senior Fellow for Constitutional Studies at the National Constitution Center. Thanks so much for spending your Wednesday afternoon with us. Tom, I am so excited. My name is Curry Sautner. Everybody, if you don't know me, I'm the Chief Learning Officer at the Constitution Center. I'll be here to help you out in the chat and the Q&A box. Anyway, you have questions for us, want to share ideas with each other, use that chat box, use the Q&A. If it does get too chatty for you, you can always close it. You don't have to have it open. That's why the Q&A is a great second source too. But I'll be here kind of moderating around this. And we always start with all these framing questions that we have for Tom and we have to put him really to his task. He has 30 minutes to go through the longest section of the United States Constitution, Article 1. So Tom, here are some of the big questions that we have today. So number one, what role does Congress have in the government? So what's its primary job? And then what are the other roles and duties that Congress has? And then what powers of Congress, what are the powers in Article One that Congress is granted? And how do they use those powers? Did the framers, when they came up with this idea in 1787 and that amazing building behind me, did they think this is how Congress was gonna work? Because as we talk about it, you know, it's definitely the lawmaking process is definitely difficult. As you like to tell me, Madison said it was complicated. <laughs> uh, is that the way they wanted it? Was that the intention? And then finally, what are some major key hypotheticals of today and Supreme Court cases that change the powers of Congress or explain them in different ways? So that's kind of all of our big questions we want to get covered today. Where would you like to start? Would you like to start with the powers of Congress or do you want to jump right to the hypothetical and then work backwards? Let's, let's jump to the hypo and then let's work backwards. That's a great idea, Curry. Okay, great. So here is this awesome hypothetical that Tom wrote that I love and it's making this week's class so much fun. So does Congress, does Congress have the power in the constitution to pass a law requiring everyone to wear a mask during a pandemic? Now, remember we do constitutional questions at the National Constitution Center. So this is not a should question. It is, does it have the power? May Congress do this? That's a constitutional question. So let's start off with you all in the chat. You can think about kind of yes, no, maybe, or as we begin this class, you can always start off with, I need more information first before I decide. We're just teeing it up and then we're gonna jump through the constitution. So go feel free in the chat and Tom, anything you'd wanna add for everybody? So no, I think, I think that it's sort of the, what this is trying to get at at the very beginning is like this idea that, you know, when the framers put Congress in place, they wanted to one, create a body that was more powerful than the Congress and the Articles of Confederation. So the body that preceded the constitution. But on the other hand, they did want Congress to be a body with limited powers. And so it's this balance between more power, but not too much. And the thing to remember there too, is that Congress, unlike the states, so the states had broad powers to pass laws to promote the health, safety and welfare of their citizens. These are the state's police powers. They're very broad, not really limited in any important way. But with Congress, Congress, we always have to ask the question, where is the power? Where in the Constitution does Congress have the power to do X? And so this hypothetical is meant to get at that very question. And I love that because we should be doing that with every action by our government. Where is the power or where is the limitation? And I love uh, Baron Sherrod. Nope, I want more information before, before I decide this, which I yes. love, <laughs> which is a great answer. I love it. And then I thought Joan's comment was great. Um, there's limits on Congress like seatbelt to limit it for your own safety. <laughs> I thought that was a great analogy. So do you want to, Tom, you want to jump into kind of the powers of Congress at this point? Yeah, let's, let, let's, let's begin sort of at the, 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 let's frame it with the convention and then go into the specific powers. I think that's a good way to think about it. So if let's, as we always do, rewind to the Constitutional Convention, September 1787, where we get, um, uh, you the, the draft of the Constitution. And when we're thinking about Congress, we have to have in mind that the framers expected Congress to be the most powerful branch of government. Article one of the Constitution lays out Congress, its structure, its powers, the limits on those powers, and even some limits on the powers of the state governments. And so with that, Article one is the longest part 
of the original constitution. The, the framers spent the most time at the convention debating it. They spent the most, <laughs> the, the greatest number of words carrying out what it was gonna look like, what it was gonna do, what it wasn't going to do. And you know, the idea here is, as I sort of said at the beginning, the framers, are, they weren't writing on a blank slate. We had a previous system of government, the Articles of Confederation. We even had state governments written into state constitutions. All of this comes before the constitution. And so when the framers are there in Philadelphia, they're looking back one at the Articles of Confederation. And what do they see there? They see a government that's too weak to carry on our national mission, that it was unworthy of a great nation. And so they're looking back at the Articles of Confederation. They're looking back at controversies leading up to the convention like Shays Rebellion. They're looking at all of these problems they saw in the Articles of Confederation and asking a very difficult, but in a way simple question, which is what sorts of things do we think a national government needs to do? When do we have to speak with a single voice? When do we need to set a national policy? And we don't want, again, we don't want the national government to do everything. We didn't just fight a revolution against the British, against the distant government to put in place another big distant government in Washington. We still wanted the states to do quite a lot, but we also wanted certain things for the national government to do, for the states to do together in that national government. And so looking at the articles, they thought, well, we think the national government, government needs to speak with a single voice on the world stage. We want the national government to really set our foreign policy and to speak for us as a nation. We don't want states coming up with separate treaties, et cetera, et cetera. We also wanna give Congress the power to tax and spend. We don't want Congress to do everything, but we do want Congress to have the power to tell people to pay taxes and then to implement programs that we think are going to address national problems. So that's sort of the taxing and spending power. And we also want Congress to have the power to settle disputes between the states to be able to regulate what it says in the constitution, interstate commerce, you know, sort of trade between the states. Before the constitution, we see different states putting up barriers to keep businesses from other states from, from transporting their goods into their states. And so we wanted to create effectively a national market. We wanted, to, we wanted to eliminate those barriers and we wanted a free flow of commerce. So the framers are sitting there in Philadelphia thinking about what are these national purposes and what, so what do they do? Well, first we have James Madison, at, at, you know, as we often say with the Virginia plan, framing the conversation, framing the debate. And what he says is what we need to do is we need to set out a general principle that's gonna guide this entire drafting process. And the principle was, uh, you know, it's easy to state but difficult to carry out specifically. It was that we want to make sure that the national government, that Congress can act on genuinely national problems. The way he put it was when the states are separately incompetent, when the general harmony of the union is at stake, that's when Congress needs to act. So the framers adopted this resolution, but also said, wait a minute, that is way too broad. We do not trust this new Congress. With, what is that, what is separately incompetent general harmony? That's way too broad. What we need to do is we need to set out in the constitution, what the powers of Congress are that will help sharpen our minds as to what's truly important to what the nation really needs to do. And it's important looking forward so that when Congress passes new laws, we can hold up our constitutions and say, where is the power? Where is the power? Just as we're saying with the national mass mandate. And so we end up with the list that Curry has here on the screen. This was initially the work of something called the Committee of Detail which came together roughly two months into the convention. And what they had was they had all of the resolutions the convention passed to that point. They had some examples from state constitutions. They had plans from different framers like Charles Pinckney. And they came together and they said, we're gonna take all of this. We're gonna take those resolutions, the messy resolutions the conventions passed, and we're gonna create the first real draft of the constitution. And so in that draft, we see things like what we see on article one, section eight here, versions of the power that first went to lay and collect taxes to tax and spend for the general welfare. We see the beginnings of the interstate commerce clause, the power to regulate commerce with foreign nations and among the several states. We see the necessary and proper clause added to the constitution at this point, this idea that we're gonna, Congress will have all laws which shall be necessary and proper for carrying into, for, into execution the foregoing powers. And so with this skeletal government that the, the skeletal constitution, the committee of detail put in place, the convention then for the rest of the convention debates these powers and settles on that list that you had on the screen uh, initially, Curry, of the set of powers that, of what Congress can do. And we see it just as, as sort of like, a, you know, if you want to look at the Constitution yourself, the places to look for these powers really roughly are Article 1, Section 8 gives you the powers of Congress. Article 1, Section 9 is clear on certain things, certain powers that Congress does not have. And then Article 1, Section 10 ends up being this really interesting provision where it's, we, where it's saying there are certain things we don't want the states to do. 
We know traditionally the states can do nearly everything. These are a small number of things we don't want the states to do. And they're exactly what I talked about at the beginning. We don't want them to enter into treaties with foreign nations. We don't want them coining their own money and sort of messing with the national market, the national currency. We don't want them to impair contracts. And then finally, we wanna make it clear in Article 6 that the national law is supreme. The constitution, the laws passed by Congress, treaties, they win out over state and local laws. Now, just to be clear, Curry, that doesn't mean Congress can do whatever it wants. We still well, have to ask it. that initial question, does Congress have the power? But if Congress had the power, Congress wins. And I'll sort of pause there. I think that's really, so first of all, we have to look for the power and then we have to go through the process. Cause that's the other thing before we answer this question, yeah. there's a part of this that says the process is, you know, and our team did this like great little fun infographic here that I love, but it's, it's not easy. This actually makes it look easier than it is. It's, it's difficult to pass a law. So I guess one of the questions was, do they have the power to pass that law? And then do you think they can get it past this process? And I don't think we really talked about in the, that in the last classes. Is this system this complex? Is that what Madison calls it? Complex, not difficult? Complicated. He says other things, but Sorry. complicated. I'm so close to the right word. A complicated process. Is, is that going to be a barrier to a law being passed or a safeguard to the wrong law not being passed? So could you just break us down is this the way they wanted it to work? And if so, why? Yeah, absolutely. So, I mean, we hear complaints all the time. Congress doesn't work. The process is slow. It's frustrating. Madison said complicated. There's a certain degree to which we have to look at that and say, that's not a bug of the system. It's a feature. The framers mm -hmm. did want a slow process. They wanted a complicated process. They want it to be difficult. And so we see you know, with this, this is a great graphic. I, I uh, your, your team did a wonderful job with it. And yeah, what, no. what it does is, you know, just to clarify, what, what ends up being the process here? Well, if we want to pass a national law, and that, a law, again, it's going to cover the entire nation. It may tell states, you can't do this. It may tell people throughout the nation, you can't do this. And so we want it to be really hard. And so what that requires is, one, the law has to pass both houses of Congress. So it, it's going to start in one, it's gonna to go to the other and it's gonna to have to pass both of them. And so again, the framers made the conscious choice. They, want, they thought Congress was gonna be dangerous. They thought Congress was gonna be powerful. They wanted to split the power between two houses of Congress. In their theory, they also wanted to have different theories of representation in those houses with the House of Representatives being linked to population. So the larger the state, the more the representatives and the Senate linked to equal representation. So every state receiving two senators, no matter its size, whether it's huge like California, or small like Rhode Island. And so they wanted, the, they wanted every law to have to pass through both of these houses, but that wasn't enough. They also put in place the presidential veto. And so a bill passes the House of Representatives, it passes the Senate. Spending bills have to start in the House, but other bills can start in either the House and the Senate. But if once both houses pass a bill, it goes to the president's desk and the president has to make a decision. Do I sign it or do I veto it? If I sign it, it becomes law. And so again, if a, law is if, if a law is successful, it's passing both houses of Congress, it's passing through the president's desk, Well, the president could also veto that bill. And in that case, Congress, it goes back to Congress and Congress then has to vote by a two thirds vote in both houses of Congress to say, yeah, we still want that law. Now this is really hard to do. It happens sometimes, but it's unusual. It really requires an issue where it unifies different factions. And in our, in our nation today, it unifies both parties usually. Um, so it happens sometimes, but there's a way in which for many, many laws, the president gets the final word, the president can veto, and then that's it. And of course, for any law that is successful, that passes both houses of Congress, that, that that's the president signs, it still can be challenged in the courts after that. And so even like a, a, an ordinary American who think, who's, who's somehow harmed by that law and thinks it's unconstitutional, could go to court and say, court, declare one way or the other, constitutional, unconstitutional, use your power of judicial review to have a say here and settle that question. So it's a really hard process. Now, Curry, why do we have this process? Is it a crazy process? What's, what's the big theory behind it? Well, it's that we really want to slow politics down. We want it to be hard for Congress to act. Um, but what, 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 what is this, what is the, um, you know, what's the theory behind it? Well, we hope one, you know, the most obvious one is that we hope for various checks to make sure that no, no, no faction can do things that's gonna make a lot of people unhappy. We want action to really unify a variety of interests in the nation. But more importantly, by a, a slow process, we want there to be deliberation. We want there to be debate. 
We want there to be compromise. And we want effectively through this process, through all these checkpoints, we want the bad laws to be thrown out. We want the flawed laws to be improved. We want the really good laws to even be refined a little bit further with the idea that we are going to deliberate, we're gonna compromise, and that this hard, difficult process is gonna create laws that serve the common good. That's the big theory. They're gonna serve the common good. Now, whether or not that has worked over time is an entirely different question. Yeah, we'll save that to the next class. Yeah, we can bracket that. <laughs> That'll be Friday's class when we talk to Congress, uh, Congressperson Mary Gay Scanlon. Barron's great question here says, okay, so they can make the law, but it can be vetoed by many methods. Well, it can be vetoed by the president, but Baron, I think you also bring up the fact that, uh, that Tom has brought up before in these classes, which is the law can actually go through Congress and get passed, and then the people can bring it to the courts and the courts can, in a way, veto it as well or find it unconstitutional. So there's lots of checks, checks and balances here. And Tom, I love the idea that this process is difficult and convoluted because in a thing, Congress won't pass a law that's fickle. That's what my mom used to say. No fickle laws get through Congress. And number two, that mean, meaning like it's not just on a whim. It has to be done in, it with teamwork and they have to be refined and polished to be able to get through the process. And then the court is always there as the final check and backup if it's not deemed constitutional or they don't have the power to do it. So I love that kind of framing because our hypothetical is great, but the question can also fall back to, can they get it passed? Mm -hmm. Not just, do they have the power? Can they get it passed or done? Um, so great ways to think about this. Now, before we get back into that question, and we're going to keep an eye on time here, I'd love to jump into some of the court cases around the powers of Congress so that it helps explain mm -hmm. when has the necessary and proper been used? When has the taxes been used? Um, wh how have we seen uh, Congress's powers defined by the courts? So do you want to start with the Marshall Court? It's always a good start. Absolutely, yeah. And so like, obviously there's a lot to cover, but I'd love to give you just a taste of a couple different periods in time and how both the politics of the moment and the court of the moment interpreted Congress's power. So, you know, the first period is the period of the Marshall Court. This is the period prior to the Civil War. It's 1801 to 1835. And what do, if we're looking at the Marshall Court's legacy in this area about the scope of Congress's power, what would we say about it? Well, I think if I were to like boil it down to a short paragraph, it's that on the one hand, the Marshall Court was clear that Congress's powers were limited. They never lost that vision. That was absolutely the case. But they did read the powers of Congress broadly and broadly in a way often to promote the commercial development of America. And so the two cases here are great examples of that. McCullough v. Maryland tackled this question that vexed the, vexed the Washington administration, that divided Hamilton and Madison, this question of whether or not a bank of the United States is constitutional, whether Congress has the power to enact it. And what Marshall did, he said, yes, Congress does have that power. Um, you know, he made a variety of arguments, but you know, one of them really turned on um, what we would say is a broad reading of the necessary and proper clause. That you know, with the necessary and proper clause, we bring in implied powers. And so you know, with that, what Marshall effectively said was, you know, a national bank is a really useful thing for Congress looking to carry out its powers that are listed in the Constitution. And so we see a pretty broad reading of congressional power there. And in Gibbons versus Ogden, we see a pretty broad reading of the word commerce. So with McCullough, it's really a, broad, a fairly broad reading of the Necessary and Proper Clause. And with Gibbons versus Ogden, it's a fairly broad reading of the commerce power. And in different periods in our constitutional history after that, we'd, we, we would see people on both sides of the debate over Congress's power try to fight over what was the meaning of McCullough and what was the meaning of Gibbons and sort of how does that connect with the framers original vision of the constitution. But that's the Marshall Court era. Should we, should we flash ahead or, or, or? Yeah, I was gonna fast forward to the Lochner era. <laughs> yeah, okay, so, so yeah, so we'll, we, we've talked enough about reconstruction so we can sort of bracket <laughs> that as much as I always wanna talk about that. But so, okay, so you know. with Marshall, with the Marshall Court, our inheritance is a fairly broad necessary and proper clause, a fairly broad commer commerce power. And with this, it gives governments, it gives Congress, you know, the constitutional resources to pass big laws. Now, Congress doesn't do this for most, much of the period before the Civil War. But as we're getting towards the end of the 1800s, so this is sort of past the, core, the, the sort of the height of Reconstruction into the Gilded Age, what we see are governments at all levels beginning to pass a range of new laws to address a changing economy. 
things are changing. We have big businesses, big factories, powerful railroads, dangerous jobs for workers. And we see states and Congress beginning to address these challenges. But on the flip side, we see people coming to court and saying, as to Congress, what happened to our government of limited powers? How can you square some of these broad actions to you know, set working conditions for workers like minimum wage laws, maximum hour laws? How can you do, say that we can't have child labor? Those sound like things the states usually do. Where does Congress get the power to do this? And with the court during this period, which is often criticized by scholars, this is called the Lochner era, um, you know, it, it, and, and, but you know, the court really was dealing with a, a, a difficult set of issues, sort of trying to, how do you take the original vision of a limited government and translate it into a new era where there's just way more laws being passed than before, where the economy is so much more interconnected than it was before. And so what we end up seeing in this era is, you know, as to Congress, you know, two, two moves by, by the court. You know, one, is, and the, both of them are, are sort of in, in response to the Marshall Court legacy, which is we're going to try to figure out a way to limit the commerce power, and we're going to read the necessary and proper clause in a more narrow way. And we're also going to read the Tenth Amendment. So the Tenth Amendment, which protects federalism, which protects the power of the states in a broader way. And so this doesn't mean, to, to be clear, during this era, the Supreme Court is still upholding more laws than it's striking down. Where we're seeing the court become more active in policing the laws passed by the states, but also by Congress. And I think the best example of this on the list there, Curry, is Hammer versus Dagenhart. So this is, a, this is Congress in, in 1916 passes the uh, Owen Keatings Act, uh, which, it, which ends, it, what's, what it's looking to do is to ban products that are created by child labor. And so the question is, you know, is this the sort of thing that's constitutional? Congress says, of course, this is constitutional. You Supreme Court, one, we have, the, we have what the Marshall Court said. Two, you have said it's okay for us to regulate things that are moving around in commerce between the states. This can be harmful products. This could also be products that we think are immoral, like lottery tickets, mm. like alcohol. You've said that that's okay. How can it be okay for us to now set something saying that if a product's created by child labor, that's also immoral and we should be able to say that that can't be out there in interstate commerce. But the Supreme Court in a five to four decision pushes back and it says, well, no, what you're doing here, and, and it's really, the, the language is quite striking. They're saying, if we say it's okay for Congress to do this, to set conditions of who employers are going to hire inside an individual state, the sort of thing that we expect states to do through their police powers, there is no more 10th Amendment. There is no, traditional, no more traditional uh, system of federalism. Congress can control everything, and that can't be the answer. The products here themselves are not dangerous. I think Hammer v. Dagenhart, the ch it was a 14-year-old who was working in a cotton mill in Charlotte, North Carolina. Um, but, you know, in the end, the products aren't harmless. They're, they, you know, are, are, are the, the products are harmless. And Congress, what you're trying to do is set national work standards for the entire nation, even if it's businesses that aren't doing interstate business, but just end up in one state. And so here, it's Congress trying to set that limit, Curry, and trying to say, we have this problem of a broad national power, more laws being passed, and we need to, we need to limit it somehow. So again, so, and that was mostly around the Commerce Clause. Was that the, air, the power that Congress yes. said they had the power? Got it. Okay, because then you're going to lead me to my favorite case to talk about, which is almost like the opposite of that case, where they said, you can't tell it's not your job, Congress, to tell a factory in Idaho or wherever it was, I can't remember the state, what, who they can hire in that factory. And then we get, what, flash, what, flash forward, I can't say the word right now, to Wickard uh, v. Filburn in 1937. And this is about a farmer growing wheat for his animal on his farm. And Congress um, said they could use the Commerce Clause to affect that farmer. In a way, so could you tell us about this? Because I think they're they're almost polar opposite cases. Mm -hmm. The way the courts decide it. Absolutely. So I mean, Hammer v. Dagenhart's 1918, Wickard v. Uh, v. Filburn. A lot is is I think it's it's 1942, um, a, a, and a, a lot happens in between those two years. What intervenes? The Great Depression. And so we have FDR elected. We have economic disruption like we've never seen in this country, and we see a, a national government doing more than it's ever done before, passing big national regulatory policies, things that we still have like social security and really redefining, trying to redefine the relationship between the American people and the national government. And so here, 
we see eventually with we see an, a, a shift on the Supreme Court, where the Supreme Court is eventually, and in, as we get to Wicker v. Filburn, saying the Lochner era was wrong, and Congress needs to have more power to regulate the economy. Wicker v. Filburn is the classic example of this. You're right, Curry. Who who is who is Mr. Filburn? He is poor Roscoe Filburn is just a small he's a small farmer. He's creating wheat on his farm. Not even for himself to eat. He's he's creating the wheat for his animals to eat. I think it was it was what it was. And so he's not selling his wheat in international interstate commerce. He's not selling his wheat to anyone. But Congress has passed a law called the Agricultural Adjustment Act, which sets limits limits on how much he can grow on his own farm. And so the question is, can Congress do that? And Mr. Filburn is saying, of course Congress can't do that. I'm doing nothing in interstate commerce. I'm just sitting here feeding my animals. How can Congress reach what I'm doing? And an opinion, a, a unanimous opinion by the Supreme Court, written by the great Justice Robert Jackson, said Congress can do that. It absolutely can do that. And we know at that moment we are no longer in the Lochner age. It's not the Lochner era. It's a new age defined by the New Deal, but defined by justices appointed by Franklin Roosevelt. Bruce Ackerman calls these transformational constitutional uh, the Supreme Court appointments, and 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 that's exactly what we see. And what the court says is. You know, Mr. Filbert, you may be on your own farm, you may be consuming, your, you may have your animals consume your wheat, but when you make that decision, you're not buying wheat in the open market. This affects, if, if, if we take what you're doing and other people do the same thing, it disrupts the entire wheat market. And Congress, because that's something that, that spans the entire economy, the effects of what you're doing, if combined with other people, has a massive effect on interstate commerce, and that has to fall within Congress's commerce power. Uh, needless to say, so Wicker v. Filburn, a unanimous decision of the Supreme Court, but remains, you know, hotly debated among scholars today. Um, it, and it really, it, it, it's the outer limit of Congress's power yeah. under the Commerce Clause. I refer to this as the butterfly effects because it feels like anything can can then fall under that. Like anything, me buying, you know, toothpaste um, at one store instead of the other, it feels it feels like very broad reaching. Now, do we do we have cases in kind of the new Federalist time period that kind of shrink Filborn or kind of what? And again, we're looking at where are the powers that Congress has given. This is pretty broad. Then you can say if it affects commerce, which a mass mandate could affect commerce, because then people wouldn't be able to travel to another state to say go to a concert venue or something like that because they might have to wear a mask or some kind of effects even if it's state state to state travel? Yeah, so I mean, it's a, it's a great question. Really. What we end up seeing is that from 1937 to 1995, the Supreme Court basically allows Congress to do what it wants with the Commerce power. It doesn't strike down any law between 1937 and 1995 as exceeding Congress's Commerce power. And so it's a broad rule of deference from the New Deal revolution up to 1995. Um, but then what we see is with Chief Justice William Rehnquist, who, uh, you know, takes his seat in the, in, as Chief Justice in the late 1980s, and then his former law clerk, Chief Justice John Roberts, becomes Chief Justice in the aughts. We see the Supreme Court try to, try to, you know, sort of find a limiting principle for Congress's power under the Commerce Clause. And so, you know, surely they're looking back at something like Wickard and saying that's a really broad uh, you know, that's, that, that's sort of a really broad approach to congressional power. What we were taught and what we know is that the Congress is supposed to be a body of limited powers. How do we find those limits? And, you know, the, the, the thunderbolt in the legal world was that first case, United States versus Lopez. And so here it's dealing with a national law, the Gun Free Schools Act of 1990. And what this act says is that people can't bring guns into school zones, effectively trying to keep guns out of schools. And you know, Mr. Lopez brings a concealed weapon into his school and he's prosecuted under this congressional law. And so, you know, what does Mr. Lopez say? He says, what is Congress doing passing a law that's really just addressing gun safety? This has nothing to do with the economy. This is way beyond, this is a traditional area that we would expect the states to handle. And this is way beyond Congress's power under the Commerce, Commerce Clause. And most scholars just expected, I think at the time, for this, this challenge to lose because con the Supreme Court had done nothing to limit the commerce power between 1937 uh, and, and, and 1995. But the Supreme Court in a five to four decision said, no, 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 Mr. Lopez is right. There, th this is, we have, dis you know, we're, 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 we have to provide, you know, we have to, we try to figure out what are the limits of Wickard v. Filburn? What are the limits after Wickard v. Filburn? They don't overturn Wickard v. Filburn. But what they say mm. here is that what Congress is regulating, it's not an economic activity. It's not really related to as an economic activity at all. And it has such an indirect effect on interstate commerce that it exceeds Congress's power. 
And so with Lopez, oh, I'm sorry, Karen, yes. I was just gonna say, so they started to find like that there has to be an effect on interstate commerce. There has to be like some kind of substantial effect on commerce and to be, to measure it. Cause in a way it feels like the last case was like unmeasurable in a way. Like you could say it has an effect and it probably does, but how much of an effect one guy on one little farm. Yeah, and I mean, Justice Breyer in dissent in this case just says, you know, of course gun violence affects the economy. It affects education, which affects the economy. And what the majority says is that's just, that's, that's, too, that's too much of a leap. It's, you can, once you can make sort of a jump to a jump to a jump, it's giving Congress too much power. So it ends up really in a way, Curry, and even extending back to the New Deal, the debate on the court is often, you know, on the one hand, some justices saying we need the Supreme Court to have a rule that sets limits on Congress. And then the other side isn't so much saying that Congress's power is unbounded, but what it's saying is the economy is expanded. You can see how interstate commerce is affected by a lot of things. And we're just going to leave this question to, the, to Congress itself and elections. So in, in effect, it's, it's, a, it's a theory of republicanism as we're going to, if Congress exceeds its powers, the people will check them. That's the theory at least. And we have a great question uh, before we get to the final hypothetical real quick. There's a great question from Zach in the Q&A from earlier that I just wanted to, to kind of ask out because I think that your point is valid, it, that the people, it goes back to the people. If you have Congress not doing what you want them to do, then you affect, can affect them in the election. And we really quickly, you know, didn't really talk about the House and the Senate, but you could the House is supposed to be the most responsive, which is why taxes was given to them, to the people, which is why their terms are only two-year terms. They're younger, they're tw the youngest they can be is 25. The Senate is 30, six-year terms. So Zach's question, long way to get there, sorry. Um, due, to the, uh, Congress, due to the members of Congress coming from all different walks of life and technically can be pretty young, how do they learn the legal language um, of the laws to be able to write them in a way that stands up to the Supreme Court? And was this an issue at any time in the past? I love this question, it's such a smart question. Um, and I know we have Mary Gay Scanlon coming on Friday. She is absolutely a lawyer. <laughs> She's one of the largest firms in Philadelphia um, and was a lawyer for education for years and then became a congressperson. But that's a great point by Zach. How do you expect Congress people to be able to write laws that stand up to the Supreme Court when they may not have that experience? Yeah, that is a great question. I mean, one practical answer is that Congress has always been filled with lawyers. <laughs> I could just, as a practical matter, it has. But I mean, I think if you go back to the founding, there was, you know, a thought that, you know, it was a small R Republican vision of the Constitution, which is that it's not going to be super long. People are going to be able to read it and understand it. And we hope that our laws would similarly be that way. Now, of course, laws have become increasingly complex over time. But the thought was, you know, maybe we don't want everyone who's speaking about the Constitution, and what the government's going to do, to just be speaking in legalese. The one other thing I'll add, Curry, is that, you know, one uh, scholar of the New Deal, Barry Cushman, says that part of the problem with the early New Deal laws was just that there was so much happening. Congress was doing so much. The executive branch was doing so much that you just wound up with sloppy drafting. And so part of it was a shift in political power, a shift on who was on the court too. But part of it too was just the, the lawmaking, the law writing became more precise over time. And that made it easier for the Supreme Court to uphold what the New Deal administration was doing. So just wanted to bracket that in yeah, there too. Yeah, which I love that like comment from the courts, write better laws, like do better, like go back and write this better. It's not that you don't have the powers, it's just poorly written, which I think is so awesomely harsh, but awesome. So back to our hypothetical people. Okay, time to vote. Um, so here's your job. You can write yes, no, maybe, I still don't know enough. All those things are great. If you wanna put a yes or a no, say why. So does Congress have the power to pass a law requiring everyone to wear a mask? Um, and I'll flash back in a second to some of the powers of Congress because you can cite like where the power comes from in that list. Um, and so I'd love to know in the chat box now, uh, th this question, does Congress have the power to pass a law requiring everyone to wear a mask during the pandemic? I'll give you a minute. Uh, I love these answers already. And let me They're put great. this up here. I know. <laughs> okay, so I'll start reading them. Yes, but it can be checked. Got it. Yep, you're totally right, Baron. <laughs> um, at least on the checked part. Know that the power lays within uh, within the state. So Juliet says it's the state's job, not Congress's job. So mm -hmm. she's going to go with no. Uh, maybe using the elastic clause. 
I like that. I appreciate that. I, I like to bring up necessary and proper as well. Joan shares that yes, to promote the general welfare. We've got a couple no, no, no's. Depends on the language of the mandate. <laughs> Love that. Colin. Love it. <laughs> Colin, you're totally going to be a lawyer with that answer. <laughs> uh, maybe Peter, good answer. And no, but the president can go through the executive order. That was from Jackson. Um, and mass DO typically contain an elastic clause after all. I think that was supposed to be funny too, but I'm not sure. Um, yes, it protects the community. These are coming in so fast. I agree with Colin. And no, it should be up to, Don said up to the individual states. And Peter shared that today's presentation was different than Monday. Every day is different, even though we have the same content. <laughs> So, Tom, give I us hope a that's break. okay. <laughs> I, we, what, just in case, like, we make sure we cover the same content in these classes, but because we're um, every scholar is different we, and all the questions are different, we kind of go in different directions. So, Tom, give us a breakdown. I'll go back to the question. What do you think? Do you think, does Congress have the power? If so, where is the power? But as Juliet's point, is it more of a state's job to do this? And where do you think, how do you think it will fall out? Like, not just do they have the power, but can they get it done? Yeah, no, I think great answers all around. And within those answers are what I think, you know, the various ways that, that uh, the Supreme Court would analyze this case. The first point is, is totally right, which is that this is traditionally what we would expect the states to do. Um, and they are. I mean, some states are doing this, but it's, it is within the core of the state police power to promote the health, safety, and welfare of the residents. And under the Supreme Court's well-established precedents like Jacobson versus Massachusetts in 1905, you know, this would see, the states would seem to have quite a bit of power to address a public health emergency. Although I would urge everyone to read the series of Supreme Court opinions from Friday in the uh, Roman Catholic Diocese versus Cuomo case, which gives you a sense of the range of views on the court about how to address, you know, state and local laws that are, are dealing with the pandemic and sort of the public, the questions of public health versus constitutional rights. So that's the states, I'll bracket that because we have already said Congress does not have a police power. Congress has to be able to find its power somewhere in the constitution to do this. And you guys have already identified really the main powers that Congress might draw on here. I'd say that there would be sort of three main clauses you'd look to. One would be the power to tax and spend for the general welfare. Um, another would be the power to regulate interstate commerce. And the last one would be the necessary and proper clause, the elastic clause. And so, you know, just to take each in turn very briefly, I know we don't have a lot of time left, Curry, but, um, you know, I think, I think more broadly, what we would say is a lot really would depend on how Congress drafts the mandate. And so, you know, the challenge or someone challenging the constitutional, constitutionality of the mandate, they're going to be in a relatively stronger position if the mandate's quite broad quite general, not limited in time in any way. And so really is just, just a massive general mandate. I think that they have stronger arguments under that sort of mandate. Whereas Congress would be in a much stronger position if it really sets, a, it tailors its mandate to one, economic conditions. So really like a, a, ma a mandate that is linked to when people go to work, when people go into businesses. So Congress would be able to say that's more within the core of its commerce power. Um, and also if it created a mandate that was time limited in some way, whether it's a specific date, an end date for a mandate like that, or one that's linked in some way to concrete indicators, things like test positivity rate in a state or a county or in the nation, um, or when X percent of the population has a vaccine, or you can, you can come up with any sort of creative way you want, but you would imagine that Congress would want to figure out a way to make the mandate tailored in certain way, both making it more about economics and then also limited in some way. And so looking through these different provisions we highlighted, you know, the power to, to lay and collect taxes, the power to tax and spend for the general welfare. Broadly speaking, the Supreme Court has recognized a really broad power here for Congress. Congress can use this power to try to get states to do things that Congress wants it to do, but it's not an unlimited power. So just as recently as the first Obamacare case, NFIB versus Sebelius, um, you know, seven of the justices signed on to opinion, limiting Congress's spending power, making sure that Congress, one, is spending, taxing and spending for the general welfare, two, is providing clear instructions to the states. So in this case, would really have to say what sort of mandate they have to pass and really what the clear consequences are. Mm. Three, the, the, the spending can't in some way violate another provision of the Constitution like the Bill of Rights. And four, it can't be super coercive. 
So the penalty can't be so extreme that it's really forcing a, 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 a state to do something it really, really doesn't want to do. But the law would provide some sort of carrot or stick, more national money if you, if you uh, put the mandate in place or some money taken away if you don't do it. So that's the taxing and spending. The, the commerce question is, you know, I, I sort of previewed it in what I had already said, which is that, you know, Congress would argue in this situation that, you know, of course the pandemic's affecting commerce across all states in a really huge way. And if Congress tailors the mandate in such a way that it's linked to economic activities like going to work, going to businesses, it's gonna be in a relatively stronger position. Whereas the Roberts Court and the Rehnquist Court before it, as we know, give some resources for the challengers to push back. Because what mm -hmm. the court has been searching for is what is the limiting principle of the commerce power? In the first Obamacare fit case, uh, NFIB v. Sebelius, they said that at least under the commerce clause, under the commerce power, Congress can't regulate inactivity. It can create, it can regulate activity, but not inactivity. So Congress can't use its commerce power to force you to buy health insurance if you don't want to do it, to eat broccoli if you don't want to eat broccoli, et cetera, et cetera. There are many ways in which those hypotheticals worked in the oral argument, but the idea being that there is some limit to what Congress can force you to do. And so you would expect the challengers to look at that. And then finally, the necessary and proper clause, we've long debated going all the way back to Madison and Hamilton all the way to today, how broadly the necessary and proper clause sweeps with the Marshall Hamilton Washington position being that it really does allow Congress to take powers that it has written in the constitution and imply other powers that are useful for, con for Congress to carry out its core functions. And then others criticizing that as far too broad and saying that necessary and proper really means necessary. It means essential. I mean, that's what Maryland said in McCullough v. Maryland. That was the state's argument that the necessary and proper clause really requires something that's really, really closely related to that power that's listed in the Constitution. And in McCullough v. Maryland, the argument was there's no charter bank clause. And here you would argue there's no mask man, you know, no mask mandate clause, I guess. Um, and that's that's that, Curry. I think that's awesome. And so, wow, we laid out a lot for you, how Congress works, how it's supposed to work, what the jobs are, and then applied it in a modern setting. So super fun class with everybody today. And this is like my favorite part because it's stay tuned. Let's see what happens. Let's see if Congress does try to do this and how successful they are through the process and through their where they're looking for their constitutional powers. So you'll be able to support it or debate it in any way you want now after this class. So thanks guys very much. I'm gonna end the class. So if you need to jump, jump. Uh, Colin did have one really good question that I wanted to answer to too. So I'm just gonna pause the recording and get to that question. So let me pause. Sorry, 